The Drake Michigan Podcast is sponsored by Masterpiece, the nano heavy metal detox miracle. Start your journey to freedom from toxins, heavy metals, graphene, and forever chemicals. For more information and to purchase this miracle product, see the description below. Welcome to the Drake Michigan podcast. We have my best mate, Mark Ollie. Uh, he's joined us today and he's just recently released a new book. Um, have indeed. Europe's Roswell. 40 years since impact. Yeah, that's 40 the book. years. Is that what it, yeah, 40 it is? Yeah, 40 years since wow. impact. Wow. Well, so Mark's come into the studio today. We've already released uh, your original documentary onto the Drake Michigan channel. Yes. So if you've not seen that already, check the, the Mark Holly playlist. Uh, it's in there. Um, and I'm about to learn some stuff because I don't know the story, I'll be honest with you. So, so 40 years ago, something happened in Wales. It did indeed. Right. Um, okay. Um you're probably in the best position then to ask the right questions because obviously members of the public will want to know. So yeah, um, yeah. The um, early nineteen eighty three. So right. in the January, um, something came down and hit trees on farmers' fields yeah. just outside the sleepy Welsh village of Clanilla, which is. Um, several miles outside Aberystwyth okay. uh, in mid Wales. So um, the story really begins with um, there's a farmer called Irwell, Irwell Evans, and uh, he comes out to tend his lambs. Uh, we're probably talking somewhere around about the 3rd or 4th or 5th of January. Yeah. Okay. Um, so he's, he's coming out to, to tend his sheep and he, um, he reaches his fields and he's got four fields covered absolutely covered in metal really? now, yeah he said it looked like a plane crash you, wow. you look at it looks like a plane crash uh, and he's described you know there's fragments of something that looks a little bit like it might have been a craft but most of it are these big sheets of metal and bits of shattered it's like eggshell loads of this eggshell type metal everywhere mixed in with bits of what looked like aluminium foam um, an aluminium foil. So he's, he's looking at, at all this debris and he thinks, well, that's a bit weird. I didn't hear anything last night. None of that was there the night before when he checked on his sheep. Um, so what he does is he um, goes back to the house because this is in the 80s, so new mobiles are not, it's not as common. Uh, phones the police yeah. and he says, I think I've had a plane crash. Right. Um, so the, the police say, uh, hang on a minute then, um, we're just going to speak to the local MOD because there's an airbase out there nearby. So we'll speak to them and uh, we'll come and see what the what the problem is. A couple of hours later, he said it was like a scene out of James Bond. He said there was just loads of these vehicles turn <laughs> up. He said the police are there and clearly there's guys with, you know, stripes and badges yeah um, and he said the mod's there and there's lots of you know the usual squaddies and what have you the air force it was and he said but there are a couple of people there that are clearly higher up yeah and he said and there's another set of people there as well these guys in suits and he said it's the guys in suits that are ordering the other people around these uniformed officers and what have you and basically what they said to Irwell is they said, well, uh, yeah, obviously, uh, you know, something's happened here. Something's come down. Uh, we'll clean it up. No problem. So Irwell's, you know, watching what they're doing. And um, by about midnight, he gives up. They're still at it. Lights are still on. They're still clearing these fields. And he's like, well, I've got to be up tomorrow to sort my sheep out and all the rest of it. So he gets up the following day mm -hmm. and it's all gone. There's nothing left. They've completely cleared the Quite whole right. thing. Yeah. So then the story moves on a little bit. You fast forward a couple of weeks and um, there's a news clipping agency um, that a chap called Gary Rowe um, subscribes to. Because back in those days, you could you could do that. And they would send you anything that was interesting, you know, and appropriate. You just subscribe to the clipping agency. And he gets this clipping, Sunday Express. I think I'm right in saying it's the 23rd of January. Um, UFO crash in Clanilla. Right. And it's, it's a write-up about this uh, about this this UFO crash so Gary gets this and because he's he lives in North Wales himself he lives in Rill because he's part of this UFO watch group that's there yeah he, he actually knows how to contact Irwell so he contacts Irwell direct and he said um, do you know about this newspaper article and I was like no it didn't come from me 
Um, he said, well, it's here. It's in the Sunday Express. He said, can I come down and have a look at your land? See if we can find anything, you know, because it's not every day you get a UFO crash. So Gary goes down there. And Gary tells this story where, you know, he meets Irwell. Irwell takes him out and Irwell says, well, you're going to be disappointed because, you know, I know these are like four fields the size of football pitches, but they cleared them. Mm -hmm. You know, they spent the whole day clearing them. So they're leaning on this five bar gate and Gary's, Gary's looking around and he's got a couple of mates with him as well from the group. And he's thinking they won't have got it all. There's no way, there's no <laughs> way they'll have got it all. And he looks across the fields and he notices this, this wooded copse. And when you look at this wooded copse, through the top of the trees, you can see this cut. Right. It's about 20, 25 foot wide. And something has obviously come down, hit the trees, cut through the top of the trees. Wow. Some of the trees are over. Some of them are snapped. There's branches missing. Some of the timber has sort of exploded onto the field where all this debris was. So Gary then gets the team. He goes and has a look around all the fields. Doesn't find anything exactly like Irwell said he wouldn't. Yeah. And then he thinks, right, we're going in the woods. So he dives in the woods. And they're going through the trees. And, he, and Gary said you could see where to look because you could see all this debris. You could see where something had hit the trees. And they noticed that a couple of the trees have got bits of metal stuck in them. So they, you know, prize yeah, okay. these fragments out. Yeah. And he said there's no way they'll have got it all. So they're going through the bracken. They're going through the brambles and all the rest of it. And anyway, he comes out with six pieces of this metal. Yeah. And one of his pieces is quite big. It's about 12 by 10. So he's got this big piece. Um, and then also he gets two pieces of foil as well so he's got the metal and he's got the foil so he says to Earl he says well we'll come back and we'll do this again mm -hmm. we'll have a look around again and we'll see if we can find any more so a week or so later he comes back again and he has a look around this time they don't find anything at all um so he says to Earl he says well I'll tell you what we'll arrange for metal detectors we'll get metal detectorists on here and we'll we'll get some more of it anyway again about a week later so you're somewhere at the towards the end of February at this point um, he gets a phone call off Irwell, and Irwell's like, um, you're not going to believe this, they're demolishing the forest. No way. So Gary's, <laughs> Gary's at this point, because Gary knows the locals, he like, he's like, okay, that bit of forest there, that's Forestry Commission. Yeah. So Gary gets on the blower to the Forestry Commission, and he speaks to this fella, and he says, um, this wood's you shifting at Clonilla, he said, um, why are you getting rid of it? What's going on? <laughs> and this fella just kind of, eventually said it's um it's wind damage <laughs> wind, damage. wind damage, don't you know and gary said well uh, he said you normally get rid of forests you know for wind damage and it's great the way gary says it because he said you could almost you know you couldn't <laughs> see it but you could almost imagine this guy on the other end smiling and, and the guy just went no he said we don't normally get rid of forests for wind damage he said but in this case we are <laughs> so really that's the that's the crux Convenient. of the that's the crux of the matter yeah. um there's obvious, I mean, straight away, Gary was like, you know, um, Roswell, you know, the, the, the parallels, you can't escape. I mean, for those that don't know Roswell, it's yeah. 1947, um, Roswell, New Mexico, the, the, there's something crashed at a place called Corona. And this is very, very similar because Clonilla is about two miles, mile, mile or two away from the crash site. It's just the nearest place you can stick a pin in. It's very yeah. much like Roswell. Um, and at Roswell, it was Matt Brazel. It was this farmer that walked out there and, you know, there it is. Whopping great section of desert covered in debris. Mm -hmm. Very similar debris and all the rest of it. Same thing, you know, he contacts the police, ends up with the, the Air Force down there. They clear all this rubbish away, you know. Um, there's even, there's even a, a story that came out fairly recently in a documentary that Matt Brazel kept a case of fragments. Okay. Uh, now, they've never been able to find this case of debris from Roswell because they think it was hidden yeah. in the house that Matt Brazel had on his death. Okay. Now, they've took this house apart. They still can't find this case that, that was rumoured to be out there. And lo and behold, you've got the same thing. You know, there's Gary with his case <laughs> full of fragments. It's, it's like a replay. You know, it's mm. like watching a replay. 1947, 1983. Um, and then there's other similarities as well. Um I've got to mention, actually, because just while it's on my mind, um, there was a connection because it's not in the book, but as the book was literally going to publication, you know, the publishers uploading it to, to Amazon, mm. we got this photograph sent us of a piece of the aluminium foil found on the Roswell crash site, crash site by a metal detectorist. 
Wow. Like within a couple of weeks prior to the book coming out. That's now we strange. couldn't couldn't even put it in the book. You yeah, know what I mean? That's yeah. like a, a separate story. Yeah. That's not even in the book. That's that's added to. So clearly that it looks like the same scenario, literally, physically the same scenario. <clears throat> so um moving on a little bit, then Gary's got these these fragments and he's like, oh, what can I do with these fragments? What do I do with these? Straight away, first thing he does is he gets gets a piece and he starts breaking bits off. Yeah. Um and he puts them into key rings and sends them out to people who he knows have got contacts with the media. Right. And it's a good job he did. Somewhere around about the end of February, beginning of March, he gets a knock on the door. <laughs> now, this again, this is not this is not in the documentary that we did or anything like that. Because what we did was we filmed all the interviews and everything for the documentary, and then Gary took me on one side afterwards. And he said, I didn't really want to say this on camera, he said, in case I got in trouble. But he said, I'm going to the front door to open the front door, he said. And when I open the front door, I can see these these black figures and black suits, black hats, you know, incomprehensible passes. Men in black. Yeah, dark glasses, you've got it. He said, now look down the close, and there's two SUVs down there with all the windows blacked out, black mm -hmm. SUVs with no number plates. Mm -hmm. These guys basically say to Gary, they say, um, we'd like our metal back, please. Can we have our <laughs> fragments back? Please? It's like some out of Hollywood, isn't it? Well, Gary, I mean, Gary was really clever because he said, um, he said, no, you can't have your metal back, he said. And, and I've made these key rings, and I've scattered your metal all over the place. Well, he said, great idea. Cats out the bag. And he said, as long as you leave me alone and you leave me with my metal, I won't tell these people to release any of this to the press. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. And these people apparently just kind of, you know, nodded and in silence went and got back in the cars and drove off. But there's a couple of issues. I mean, that raises a couple of issues. The first issue is, who gave the story to the Sunday Express? Because oh. there was only one newspaper article and that was it. Right. And some of the details in there are not the same as the ones that Irwell remembers. Okay. So that's that's a really strange question. So the guy that actually wrote it up was a guy called Andrew Chapman. Um, he works for the Sunday Express, uh, still on the team. Yeah. So when we came to do the documentary in 2008, um, the chap we got on that side of it, a very good friend of mine called Scott Lloyd, he's a researcher, uh, National Library of Wales, Aberystwyth, does all that. Uh, so he got stuck in and he had a jolly good look around and then he couldn't find any other articles, not even in the local press. So he contacts Andrew Chapman. Yeah. So he's speaking to Andrew Chapman and Andrew Chapman says, um, he said, you're in luck. He said, because I keep all my notebooks. He said, so just leave it with me. I'll go and check the notebook for January 83. I'll come back to you with whatever information I find. A few days later, gets the phone call back again. He said, you're not going to believe this. He said, there's no record in my notebooks of where the story came from. Wow. He said, all I can tell you is, he said, we must have come back from New Year. So, like, their New Year break is, like, second or third of jam. Yeah. He said, I've come back from New Year. I'm in the office, he said, and, and it must have been a runner. He said, somebody came around the office like they used to do, handing out stories to be written up. Yeah. And he said, and that must have been how I got the story. He said, it's the only way I could have got the story is, is somebody just gave it me to write up and I wrote it up and it went out in the Sunday Express. But, same as Roswell, they had the article on the front cover mm -hmm. and then the following day on the inside cover of the local newspaper and that was it. So he only had that one newspaper article of the original. Then all of a sudden it was a weather balloon. You know, that's where that went. Well, it's exactly the same with this. The Sunday Express have got it. Well, that's a national paper. Yeah. And it's only one article and then nobody else got it. <laughs> so you're like, wow. So that's the first question. Where did the story come from? And the second question is, they must have known what was going on to get rid of the forest. Yeah. They knew that clearly. someone was poking around in that forest and that yeah, came clearly. up with something. Yeah. And who it was, because they turned up at Gary's front door asking for the metal back. So, wow. you know, it's when proper. You, when you spoke to him, was he, did he say he was frightened or was he... Well, Gary's not that kind of person Is to be not, easily no. intimidated. Like, yeah. I mean, they weren't unfriendly. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You imagine you open the doors, a couple of... It's intimidating. Yeah, though, but they it? look like government officials, you know, and they're yeah. dressed in the uniform for whatever it is they do. Yeah. You know, and they say, can we have our metal back, please? And Gary just goes, no. But that was the level it was at. It wasn't, there was no threats. They didn't look like they were carrying guns or anything like that. You know, there was no, yeah. you know, give it us back or we'll obliterate you. There was none of that kind of, you know. 
Um, so from that point of view, if you think of about it logically, if, if it was something to do with the MOD, that's pretty much what you'd expect the MOD to do, you know. Yeah, yeah. They're, just, yeah. They, they, they're going off their own playbook, you know. But then you've got the men in black involved, you've got this idea that, you know, maybe Gary was being watched. So anyway, then then it kind of goes to the next level then. It, it gets quite... <laughs> the story gets really exciting here. You're going to love this. Um in Gary's team, because he's got this UFO team, yeah, he said there are a couple of people there that have connections to the aerospace industry. So you're moving on a bit now. You're probably talking mid eighties. You know, you could even be talking early nineties. But you, you've moved on a bit now. He's had this debris a while. Um, he's a public speaker. He's doing shows, things like that. A couple of people in his team. A couple of them are a, a pair of ladies that work on airplanes. They're airplane restorers. And they look at it and they're like, well, we've never seen anything like this. I okay. haven't got a clue what the hell this is. And then he's got a couple of other people that work in aeroplane design, one of whom works for British Aerospace. Right. So he takes the material and lets them have a look at it. And you've also got these other fragments as well, so there's other people looking at it. Anyway, they're like, no, we haven't seen anything like this either. We've got no idea what this is. So anyway, eventually, it, through one of his contacts, he manages to get some of the material to British Aerospace. Now... Back then, you're talking thousands of pounds for an analysis. You know, you can't just drop it in. It's like six grand, you know, to get it an analysed. Yeah. So he, he gives it off books. He gives it off record to the lab, the British Aerospace, and they have a look at it, and it comes back. And he, I've seen the report, but it's not that relevant, so that's why it doesn't make it into the book. But I've seen the pages of the report. It's about a dozen pages or so. And the gist of it is they come back and they say it's duralamin. It's this stuff called duralamin, um, which is pretty exotic because it's a type of duralamin we've never seen before. It's right. In the report, it says it's a pure alloy. Okay. Now, me and Gary and a few other people are like, what's a pure alloy? We've never heard of this. What, what is this? Um, but that's as far as it went. That's as far as that um, report actually went. So basically, we've got the metal, we know it's aluminium, and we know it's kind of not one of ours. You know, that's as far as that went. Anyway, fast forward to um, 25th anniversary of the crash, 2008. And um, Gary got back in contact with me again. And he's, uh, this is where I get involved. This is how an archaeologist gets dragged into this. And he's like, uh, you dig things up, don't you? And I'm like, yes, I dig things up. <laughs> He said, well, how do you fancy digging up a flying saucer? I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean digging <laughs> up a flying saucer? And then he tells basically the story that I've just told you. Um, and I'm like, well, to be honest, I said, it sounds like it flew off. Mm. You know, there's no engines sticking in the ground. There's no alien bodies hanging out of discs or anything like that. Clearly that, that, that didn't happen, which makes it more miraculous, actually, because if something can smash, four fields is a lot of debris. Yeah. You know, it's like... Yeah, yeah small aircraft debris field, but then the bulk of it, the actual body of whatever it was, carried on flying. It disappeared. It left the site. Right, okay. So I'm like, well, from what you've described, I said, there's probably not going to be anything there. There's, there's not a lot we can do. So I'm like, well, it's, it's a bit of a non-starter, you know, and he's like, oh, he said, but I've got pieces of it in my garage. At which point I'm like, oh, oh, <laughs> oh you have, have you? You've got pieces of a UFO. He's like, yeah, I've got it in a case. He said, you can come down and have a look if you want. So really, that's where it begins for me in yeah. 2008. and That's exciting. It is. And he's like, well, do you think we'd get a documentary out of this? Well, okay, I'll have a go. So um, Gary's been quite good with it because, let's face it, if you had a crash UFO on your doorstep, you'd go big, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd, be, yeah. out, you'd be out there, media. And very likely, yeah. yeah. But no, Gary's kept it very close to his chest. He's played it very tight with this with this one. Yeah. Um, and I think he's done the right thing doing that. So when we came to make the documentary, um, he's like, low key, minimum number of people. Yeah. Keep keep it on the quiet, you know. We took the decision there and then as well, not really to involve Irwell too much in this. So we checked him out as a witness, everything checked out. Irwell just said, I haven't really got anything else to add to what was in the newspaper article. Yeah. He just repeated that. And he said, I don't really want to appear on camera. I don't want my location given away, you know. Anything like that. I mean, people have said, why didn't you feature the crash site in the documentary? Well, the thing is, we did. And it's quite funny, because the documentary begins, and then you've got this panning shot 
and it's a white sky, white fields, covered in white snow with white sheep on. Doesn't make good footage, you know, doesn't make good camera. It's just this panning shot like that, and it's just fields. Yeah. And people didn't realise that that's actually the that's crash it. site. That's yeah. the bit we did, you know, just on, on, on Irwell's land. But you can't tell where the hell it is. It could be anywhere, yeah, you know, exactly, at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. So yeah, that's one of these cases where, you know, the actual reality doesn't make good television, doesn't make good camera footage. Um, so Irwell, we kept Irwell out of it. Gary, like I said, kept things very tight, tight to his chest. So in 2008, I, I got an American company called Reality Films to, to market it. Um, so they put it out as a DVD, it finished up on Amazon. I think it was on Freeview and then it was on pay to view and, you know, it did the rounds. I thought, you know, this is going to take off, you know, yeah. literally, this is going to be brilliant, <laughs> you know. I got one phone call from an American radio station asking for an interview and they never followed it up. Oh, why? And it just went dead flat. Absolutely nobody seemed to pick up on the release of that documentary in 2008. Wow. So it puzzled me, it puzzled Gary, it puzzled the guys at Reality. Um, and the only conclusion we could come up with is the chase is better than the catch. So as long as it's a mystery, as long as you don't know what it is, right. you know, it can be flying hubcaps and little green men and this, that and the other and lights in the sky and, you know, things that people saw and blurry photographs and fine, that's great. Mm. But if you stand in front of the camera and you go, there's a piece of it. Yeah, yeah. It kind of, it puts it in a different place it puts it in a different ballpark so i think most people just thought nah you know we're it's not, too real that <laughs> yeah we can't be doing with this you know <laughs> oh no they do exist you know <laughs> it was that kind of response but that's 2008 so now you can fast forward to now back to what i was saying about the analysis and stuff like that gary's still playing it very close to his chest okay um so I've done the book, I've finished the book, and I've, I've run it past Gary. Gary's fine with it, we've talked about it, and that's okay. Follows very much the same format as the documentary, which is now on Drake, Michigan. Yeah. You've got that, because we, we put that up to coincide with the book release. Yeah. Um, full HD, fully remastered, director's cut, best one out there. Don't take any other substitutes, that's <laughs> the one to go to. Go for the Drake, Michigan one. Um, so that's out, that's been out since 2008, and then... Uh, the publisher, because we've got this book coming out, Philip Mantle, Flying Disc Press. Now, Philip's a bit of a star. In fact, he's a big star in, in ufology. He's been around a long, long time, and you can't hold a candle to Philip for his knowledge right. of ufology. Um, the good cases, the bad cases. You know, his archive, for example, I think has just gone off to the American... Uh, I think it's the MUFON library somewhere. He's just given a lot of his archive and, you know, it's like 16 enormous crates full of stuff, you know. And anyway, Philip's a great guy. He's, he's a real star. And uh, anyway, he contacts me one day, Philip, because we tend to talk a lot by by uh, uh, message. So he emails me and he says, um, do you think Gary would let us analyse the metal? And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> this is the ten million dollar question, right? <laughs> Gary has hung on to this stuff for forty years and never allowed it to get out of his control. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah. So I said to Philip, I said, "Okay, if you want to give it a, a, a go," I said, "I'll warn Gary. I'll put you two in touch. You know, you contact him and ask him and, and see what he'll do." So um, Philip phones Gary and has a chat to Gary, and they exchange messages a bit, and then it all goes quiet and. Philip's like, well, do you think do you think he's going to do anything? You know, I, the book's coming out on the 1st of November, you know. I think this was like August, September, you know, so it's like the countdown's on. We've only got so many weeks and the book's coming out, you know. Will you have enough time to put, put anything that we generate in it and all this? Anyway, it drags on and it drags on and we're like, no, this is not going to happen, this. And then, all of a sudden, Philip gets three fragments in the post oh, from Gary. Wow. Well, that was that was our reaction. That was like... I can't believe he sent you this material. Wow. You know, this, this is really something. So anyway, we looked at the options. We decided on a couple of labs that we could send it to that, that we, we thought were pretty reliable. Mm -hmm. And we said, right, we'll, we'll separate the, the samples. One can go off to Australia and one can go off to America. Yeah. And we'll not tell anybody, you know, we'll do it as a blind run. We'll not tell anybody what's going on and we'll not include any information from yeah. the previous one, the UK one. 
So we send these things off, marked urgent, you know, very urgent. So they go off a couple of weeks later. First report comes back, comes back from Australia. This is this is where the rabbit hole really gets deep at mm. this point. Because, you know, me and me and Philip are like, this will nail it. This will nail it. We'll know what it is now, you know. <laughs> Here we go. Well, first of all, it blows the assumption out of the water that all the metal is the same. Because we thought, just because it's like pieces of silver metal, yeah. that it was the same metal. But when you actually examine the fragments that Gary sent, they're off two different pieces of metal. Uh. So the one from Australia comes back, and the, the first thing it says in the report is, it's not duralumin. Really? The first thing it says in the report, it's not duralumin. You know, that was the assumption they were working to, that it was something that was aluminium-based. Yeah. Um, but it is aluminium-based. They said there's this stuff called aluminium foam. And what you do is you take the aluminium, uh, you mix it with something else and it causes the aluminium to foam. And when it reacts and it foams, it goes hard at room temperature. Yeah. So, you know, you're going from this foaming material that can be, you know, shaped and manipulated to a solid. But because it's a foam, it's lightweight. You've reduced the weight of the material. And they said, well... One side of it's got this grey resin on, and we think it's this particular glue that comes from America. So the American, whatever it is, type, you know, and they told us what the glue was. And then the other side, it's it's a kind of a matte green painted coating. Yeah. They said, um, you know, it's not aerodynamic. Well, we knew it wasn't aerodynamic, because that's what British Aerospace had said. That it's in their report as well. So they said, so that's what it is. Uh, it's aluminium foam. Uh, it's definitely man-made, definitely one of ours. We know exactly what it is. So me and Philip are looking at this report and we're thinking, yeah, okay, but what we didn't tell you is that this comes from a crash in 1983 <laughs> at a point when aluminium foam didn't exist. And for it to be flying around in the sky <laughs> in a vehicle in 1983, yeah. it would have had to have been developed in the late 1970s. So it doesn't sit with anything that was there at that point in time. No. Then the second report comes in. And the second report's the American one. So the Americans weighed in. And you open the report, and the first thing it says is substance unknown. Really? Unknown. Nothing else. Unknown. unknown. And then you've got the analysis. Well, the analysis is, is interesting because the analysis is like, you know, 0 0.0% this and you know, yeah, 0 yeah. .1. And then down at the bottom, it's 90-odd percent lanthium. Or lanthanum is another name for this substance. So we're like, what in tarnation is lanthium? Never heard of lanthium. So I get, I do the, I do the, you know, the research in the background on this. Lanthium is like, um, it's fairly common. Yeah. It's number twenty-seven on the list of stuff you'll find on planet Earth. All right. So it's up there with things like quartz, you know, and mud. And, you know, um, <laughs> rock, you know, you're on that sort of level. It's not, you know, it's not exotic in any way. Yeah. But it's called an exotic metal because it is incredibly difficult to extract. Okay. The process to get this metal out, tens of thousands of pounds, if not millions of pounds, you know, to, to, to refine it. And then there's just, you know, as a side issue... It's one of those metals that you also find in the upper atmosphere. You find it in the universe. You find it in comets. You find it in mm. meteorites. You find it in other galaxies and on other planets. So it's everywhere. It's universal. It's a universal substance. But this metal is the one that has the hexagons on it. Right. So it's not the same piece of metal as the one that went to Australia, but it still has the same grey resin on it. So the Americans are saying, we don't know what this is. We can't identify the resin and we can't identify the rubber. So at which point we're like, well, how did the Australians think it was an, an American glue? It's clearly not an American glue. The resin is something else. It doesn't matter what it resembles, but it's clearly it's something else. Yeah. Um, but this lanthium, you know, it's like, okay, put it in context. 1983, on a field in Wales... There's enough of this debris to cover four fields, and some of the sheets that Irwell describe are like six foot, two metres square. Well, that's billions, billions of dollars worth of technology 
to get that out of the ground, that quantity of lanthium, yeah, is yeah. is unimaginable. It's yeah. off the Richter scale. You know, it's yeah. impossible. And you've got the same scenario again. 1983, what the hell's that doing flying around in the sky? <laughs> How did they develop that during the 1970s? And where, where the hell did it come from? Now, you could argue, and this, this is where, where there's, there's two ways to go with it, and in the book, I don't, I don't go particularly down either avenue, but I do suggest it. There's, there's avenue, you know, let's go down rabbit hole number A. Maybe it's man-made. Okay. All of it, in which case, maybe it's the same as what came down at Roswell, 1947, in which case they've had 65, 70 years to, to develop it. Yeah. Or maybe it's technology left over from the Germans at the end of the Second World War. So they've had 90 years to develop it. Yeah. In which case, I could accept that it could come down out of the sky at that time, possibly. Or the other alternative is, it's not one of ours, and it is alien. Mm -hmm. In which case, either it was an alien craft using elements that are known, or it's back-engineered. So in other words, it's, it's the, came down at Roswell, and now we're messing with it. It's that scenario. So we've still, we've still not answered the problem. We're still no closer to knowing what it is. But you've now got alternative A, it's one of ours, or alternative B, it's one of theirs. And we've took the next step forward. We've, we've, we've gone that one step further. Um, so basically, we, we put the full, the actual analysis, the full parts of both reports are in the end of the book as the last appendix. Mm -hmm. We didn't manage to get it in just before it went to print. Only just, literally, it's like, you know, day before it's supposed to come out and they're uploading the PDF with the report <laughs> at the back. Just got it in by the skin of the teeth. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve it. You know, it's still still an unsolved mystery. So all those people back in 2008 that didn't really want to know because they thought it was, you know, going to blow it out of the water. It didn't. It didn't blow it out of the water. It's made it worse. Is the media never shown any interest in this then? You know, in, at all? I mean, because that would suggest that the media, of, well, we know it's con the media's controlled, so yeah. So they, they have kept, been kept away from this story. Well, I would say that is a really good question because, yes, to a point, it's true. I, I think they've they've ducked and dived and avoided it, not really wanted to go there. And but you look at where ufology was in two thousand and eight, yeah, and you're thinking that's excusable. You know what I mean? But you look at where we are now because yeah. we're literally we're knocking on the door of disclosure now. It seems to be that way, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I've said this. I've said this before. I've said you know this book is not. It's not disclosure but it's scratching at the door of disclosure because what we're basically saying is, right, you beggars, we know yeah. you're up to something. Yeah, We've yeah. got this. This is physical evidence, you know. Yeah. Come on, it's time to explain this. Yeah. You know, you can't, you can't hide anymore. <laughs> you need to tell us what's going on. Um, so I think that's coming, and I think this book is pushing that. It's pushing it further and further. So we're pushing into disclosure. But back to your original question, media. Since this book's come out, Bear in mind, I mean, we're doing this interview now, but the book's only been out four or five weeks. It's not been out long. And the media is actually picking up on it this time. Okay. But we're in a different time and we're in a different place now, mm, you know, in the true. 21st century. Mm. Um, I won't say which newspaper, but, the, but there is one particular national newspaper that has interviewed me okay. this week. I think the article's due out literally now. Right. Um, and the lady that came and interviewed me, I mean, if she'd have come and interviewed me in 2008, it would have been, ha ha, they're having a laugh. This is a joke. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That's how 2008 would have dealt with it. Yeah. But now, now in 2023. It's showing interest. Well, she's put this article out. I mean, I've I proofread it and it's like, um, yeah, there is the real possibility that there's something out there. This this is not rubbish. This is proper technology, proper analysis. We're looking at something here we can't explain. So for a national newspaper to nail the colours to the mast, I think the headline is something like, it might be alien. You know, this, mm. this, this is unidentified. You know, she's gone down that avenue of saying this is serious it's you almost know. like they want they want that now don't they there's something going on and it's been stirring for a while in america recently. yeah it's in the senate and things like that where they were talking about all it. of that is starting yeah. to feed through yeah, now yeah. and uh, also i think it's the way gary has handled it you know he's never sensationalized it he's never gone to the national press i think it's amazing he's, how he's kept that for 40 years 40 years never he's never gone big you know the no. documentary in 2008 is very 
straightforward. You know, there's no sensationalist aspect to that. Mm. Um, and the experts we used then were experts. You know, they were people that knew what they were doing to do the, the background work. And we've done the same again now. Mm. You know, in producing the book, we've, we've, we've kept away from the sensationalist side of it i mean there was it remained nameless but there was a website out there that covered ufos and, and they had this they had the same story and then they finished the story with a silver disc sticking out the trees with alien bodies hanging out of it you know <laughs> which actually is a story from russia that happened way back in the, the oh, 80s okay. and what they did was they pushed the two together and over sensationalized it right and that goes on a lot you know and um some of the interviewers have, have pushed me as well to come out with more material than is available yeah um but, you know, Gary is a serious investigator. You know, the, the guy that did all the documentary stuff, serious investigator. I'm a serious archaeologist. Yeah. The guys that looked at it at British Aerospace and in Australia and America, they're serious scientists. Yeah. So the whole case, the entire case, has never left the realms of being serious. Mm. You know, we've, we've kept it in the same furrow. Yeah. Like you say, amazingly, for 40 years, you know. Um, I think that's incredible. Was there any um, other eyewitnesses? Well, this is the thing. There's one eyewitness, one newspaper report, one clean-up operation, right. you know, one documentary, one everything. Only a goes, it's one, 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 one of everything. Interesting. So clearly there must have been, because where the hell did the newspaper article come oh, from? Exactly, you know, yeah. uh, I, I think it was somebody either in the local police, the local press, or at a push, maybe somebody at the Air Force base who thought, you know, we need to put this out. It doesn't make me wonder why they... Oh, how this happens, really? In yeah, terms of just releasing little new, like almost they've got to tell you somewhere somehow. Yeah, this just happened, in case it's small enough that yeah. nobody notices. And but again, and even that. then, you know, whoever put that story out, they they weren't saying, oh, it's a weather balloon, or it's marsh gas, you know, or mm. it's you know, blades off a helicopter, or whatever. They, they weren't saying it was something else. They never said it was anything less than unidentified. What did they say about Roswell's the metal that they found at Roswell, and is it is it a similar? Th Metal then, or well, the thing with Roswell is the um, none of the metal, none of the debris has actually been officially available. Okay, uh, in the nineteen nineties, I do know that National Geographic, who are like, mm, you know, they're they're the business out in the states. You don't mess with National Geographic. They took an interest in the site. And they put a professional team of archaeologists onto the crash site. Yeah, they sieved through the soil, and they got beads of this mysterious melted metal. All oh, right, but at that point, the story runs dry. So whether or not these little tiny beads, I presume they were too small to actually get them properly analysed. Because mm -hmm. I mean, the bits we sent off are like the size of your little finger. You know, they're quite big pieces, and yeah. even, even they, the the labs complain they were a little bit too small for what they would have liked to do. Right. So a couple of the tests, things like the hardness test and what have you, they couldn't do because there wasn't enough of it. But the there was enough there to get the metal. So, um, and, and this foil that came in at the last minute that this metal detector chap found on the Roswell site, you look at the piece of foil in the photograph that he sent us and it's identical to the piece of foil we've got. Hmm. You know, same thickness, same everything, same yeah. pattern, Interesting. hexagonal um, in, 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 internal structure. But that, that hasn't been analysed as far as we know. Right. And even if they get that analysed, you know, that wasn't what we got analysed. We got the sheet metal analysed. So the two pieces of foil we've got are still a mystery. Right, okay. You know, we have no idea what the, what the aluminium foil is. But again, if you look at it as a whole, you know, the, the metal, you've got these two pieces of metal now. One's the aluminium foil, aluminium-based. Let's call it aluminium. And the other one's the lanthium. So you've got aluminium and lanthium. But we've got no knowledge of what the paint is. We don't know what the resin is. We don't know what the hexagonal rubber coating is. We have no idea what that is. Yeah. And we've got these two sucking great big pieces of tin foil, and we don't know what those are either. So you're still only just putting the jigsaw puzzle together. I, I mean, personally, um, I think that the, the lanthium, I think, is the outer shell mm. because that is really, really tough stuff. It's is really it? strong, yeah. Very, very hard to break. It only snaps at, at low frequency at high frequency and high impact, it pushes back. So that would be your outer shell. Um, and then you've got your rubbery sort of coating, 
which will conduct, it's electrically conductive, right. but we don't really know what that is. I mean, all the photographs of this appear in the book as well, so it's a kind of a show and tell. You can see what this stuff looks like. Um, so you got that, but we don't know what that is. I think that's part of the outer shell, um, possibly some way of carrying current. Um, the resin, nobody knows what the resin is. And then the next layer, I think, sandwiched between two metals is the foil. So I think the foil makes up the bulk of the substance of okay. whatever it is. And the internal substance, the internal structure, I think that's the aluminium foam layer because the, the green paint on it's not not aerodynamic. It's no use for being on the outside of anything. Yeah, yeah. So that's clearly on the inside. So basically you've got the rubberized coating, you've got, you know, your lanthium, then you've got resin, then you've got aluminium foil or whatever it is possibly aluminium foil looks like alcan wrap so right. if you put your turkey in then you've got <laughs> aluminium you've actually got the foam again bonded on with resin and then your green paint so what i've just described is is the structure of, of a body of some kind that's your you know and it's slightly concave or convex whichever way you look at it that's the outer shell of of, of a craft of some kind interestingly i thought i mean it might be a stupid question but what was it feel like in the metal did it feel different to other metals you've felt before was it lighter was it well there's, there's quite a few people have handled bits of the metal and picked it up and that and it's extremely light is it um I mean, for what it's worth, people that do the psychometry things and things like that, funnily enough, they said it has a similar register to something that you'd find in outer space, like a meteorite. Right. So they've picked meteorites up and done psychometry on that, and then they pick up the metal, and it, it kind of feels the same. Right. So for me to then go to somewhere like Wikipedia and find out that lanthium is found in meteorites, I'm like, hey, oh, hey, there's the science. You know, it backs it up. Yeah, that yeah. backs that up. So it's 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 terrestrial, but it's also extraterrestrial. Yeah, you know, it, it can be either or. Interesting. Wow. What a case. You know what I mean? Ain't what a case. Um, it makes you wonder what exactly happened. Then, like you're saying, if it's come down, it's dropped yeah. a bit off and yeah. shot off. Yeah. What I th what I think is that the the design. It's it's designed to be extremely strong, and it's clearly designed with a specific purpose in mind yeah. so you can imagine i mean let's let's sort of imagine a bit something that's kind of saucer shaped because we did this in the documentary it's just a blob in the documentary because nobody has any idea what shape it is it's about 25 foot wide it's used to this vehicle is used to flying around either trapped in a force field yeah or you know breaking the sound barrier yeah. or you know even zipping through space or going through dimensions or traveling through time or whatever that is going to be a pretty high pressure thing to do you know if you can sit stationary and then one minute and then shoom, you're off at like you know 200 g or whatever that's what this thing is designed to do what it's not designed is to be hit by trees mm. so this thing's come down and it's going slow you know it's going real slow mm. and it's coming down and then you've got these trees battering the bottom of it like it's bombarding it at very slow speed right. and it's breaking like an eggshell because it's not yeah. got the force to push back i see so this is what i think's happening now gary thought the same thing because he said when he when he attacked this piece of metal to try and get the bits off he's you know, rattling it like this and he's stamping on it and gets out the angle grinder, you know what I mean? He's making no impression on this stuff at all. He said, well, when he sat there, just with a set of snipe nose pliers like that, and very slowly just pulled it like that. He said, you can snap it. That's how he did the key rings. At like, low velocity and low yeah. frequency, it doesn't push back. He said, you can snap it. And that's how he got the bits off. But he said, if you attack it, it just pushes back. You can't do anything with it. So clearly it's designed for a specific purpose. Yeah, Take yeah. it out of context and get it, you know, get it into a position that it's not used to, you know, bashing through the tops of trees. I mean, let's face it, some trees are pretty strong. Yeah. You hit an oak tree at any kind of force, it's going to, you know, mm. that's an impact. Well, clearly all the bottom of this thing, whatever it was, just got shattered, smashed off. So the upper bit with all the, you know, the business end kind of goes, vroom, flies off. And it's, it's like naked from the waist down, you know what I mean? It's just, it's all over the field. It's gone, you know what I mean? It's, and that's clearly what's happened. So God. you can look at it, you can look at the situation, you can kind of, you can fill in the blanks. You know, the, you, some of the bits of it, the structure, the design, the way it functioned, what happened, you know, you can get a feel for what was going on. 
you know. How much further can you go with an investigation like this, though? Because, I mean, it's... It, you've um, only got the pieces, haven't you? I mean, it's, you'd, be, you'd be lovely to know exactly what happened there. Well, there's two directions, I suppose, you could go. One would be to um, do a computer reconstruction of what you thought happened. You did a reconstruction of a type, though, on your documentary. Yes, we you? did. Uh, we physically puppeteered a yeah. vehicle through and crashed it. Um, yeah. To be honest, it's a great piece of reconstruction. Everyone's yeah. like, "Way, how did you do that? Because <laughs> it flies on on one, one side of the screen, then it turns and comes down. It actually manoeuvres. You can tell it's intelligent. Well, it's my lad with it on the end of a fishing line. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's, can't beat good old-fashioned models because no, they're can't. physically there, you know. <laughs> and then I gave it to the CGI bloke and the bit where it goes through is, yeah. that, you know, there's an explosion and loads of debris. But when you mix the two... You know, that takes some beating, it really does. But yeah, good old-fashioned model making. But you could do a computer, a proper rendering. You know, you could get the landscape mm -hmm. as, a, as, a, as a, a sort of LiDAR image and you can plot it. You could work that out. That might help in, in seeing what happened. And then the other thing that, that, that is, if we had bigger pieces of it, mm. um, you know, somebody was like, yeah, I'll let you loose in my lab. You know what I mean? Whatever. These big, big scale laboratories, if we had that and a big piece, mm -hmm. then you could find out what the rubbery hexagons are. You could find out what the coated paint is. There's at least two different layers of, of resin that you can go at. Chances are at that point it's worth doing the foil. Yeah, definitely. You know, so you're absolutely right to say, you know, we're, we've only done the first two rungs of the ladder. You know, we, we've got one type of metal and another type of metal. And that's all we've got. But obviously they've... Someone has got plenty of pieces somewhere, haven't they? Well, someone's got the vehicle itself. Um, you know, there's, 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 um, there are other bits in the book. I mean, the book's the book gave me an opportunity to sort of ramble a bit about my connections to UFOs. So my stories are in there, mm -hmm. very much like the same stories that appear in the documentary director's cut. Yeah, where they interview me. I thought well, it's probably time to put those in the book as well, but they're updated. The book's not the same as the documentary because there's more information has come out right. yeah, since doing it in 2008. But um, there's just a hint in there. There was a friend of mine who was an um, older teenager, shall we say. Again, I'm not going to name the guilty. Um, but he joined the army. Um, he used to go to a church that I was at and he, he joined the army as a squaddy. Mm -hmm. But he joined as a programmer. So his thing was computers. Right. And this is 1980s when, when computing was relatively new, you know, to the armed forces. So, so he went in as this cutting edge computer guy. And it's a great little story. He told me, um, it's not even in the documentary. This, he said he was, he was sat there one day, um, you know, and he's got all these computer terminals all around him, military terminals and all that. And he's bored. Yeah. You know, he's got nothing to do. They've not given him anything to do. And because he's, hyper-intelligent mega-being, you know, he's not going to sit there and do nothing. So the first thought that came to his mind was, I'll tell you what, I'm going to hack the Vatican. Because <laughs> he's got a military-grade laptop. He's on a military network, you know, and he's like, I wonder what they've got. So he's like, you know, www.jesuit.com. Oh, you know, let's go and see what we can get. Anyway, he said he was quite successful. He managed to find the portal. There's a portal to getting into the... Yeah, but there's plenty of portals. Well, there's a portal out on the web to get into the Jesuit sites, yeah. you know, and things like that. And he said, he, you know, he managed to get in like that. Everything's going fine. You know, in he goes. Military grade, remember. This is the MOD. He's going in like that. 30 seconds, they locked him out. Did they? Locked him out straight away. So he didn't have a chance. He wasn't going anywhere with that. <laughs> so he's, he's sat there going, oh, you know, I'm bored. I'm still bored. What can I do? <coughs> UFOs. Let's have a look and see what they've got. Mm. Now, MOD, British, terminal, internal. And he goes and finds a UFO in a hangar down south. No way. They've got one. Huh. And he said he actually, he, he was there. He, he got it. He had it. He had it there. He could see it. There was a shot of it in the hangar, somewhere down south, possibly, or it might even have been in Wales. He said the location wasn't immediately obvious. Hmm. And again, he said he managed to get in long enough to go through a certain number of systems to arrive at this, you know, clearly they had this UFO. And then he had to switch the terminal off because it was obvious, you know, who it was, which terminal, and his superiors were yeah. about to return. So he got as far as proving that they got one. 
Now, again, I wish I had a pound for every story I've been told like that because there's so many people out there, loads of people I've spoken to who know that there are UFOs in hangars. You know, it's it's not a big secret. It's not a big deal. Yeah. The Americans have got them. We've got them. The Russians have got them. Other people have got them. Inevitably, the Chinese will have them. Yeah. You know, they've got these things. Now, it's still, again, it doesn't answer the question, is it one of theirs or is it one of ours? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. He just put in UFO. UFO is ambiguous. It just means unidentified That's right, yeah. flying object. Yeah, yeah. So even in the military, they're going, well, you know, this, this great huge disc thing, it's a UFO, you know. Is it a drone? Is it a stealth plane? Mm. You know, is it something they're developing? You know, I mean, certainly recently, in recent years, a lot of stuff that has been touted as UFOs has ended up not being. The famous one, famous one for where we are now, is Lancashire, up on Winter Hill. Mm. They had the flying triangles in the 1990s. Triangular craft, lights on each corner and a light underneath. Why don't I remember that? Oh, it was everywhere. It was all over the news. I think it even made the news. It made, like, the BBC News, you know. I don't know why I don't know that. You know, and we have another batch of witnesses that have seen this, you know, bang, up on the screen comes this triangle with the lights on the corners. Because oh, right. they photographed it going overhead. The Chinese lanterns. <laughs> no, it's, it was worse than that. And then 19, the 1990s, and then the MOD came out, and they just went, yeah, we're going to be honest about this one. The drones, the oh, yeah. stealth drones, we're flying them out of Manchester Airport. Oh, okay. He said, we're test flying them. So at least from my point of view, that showed that the military had the capacity to be honest. Mm -hmm. These people are seeing these things. They're assuming the UFOs, you know, they're ballooning out of all proportion. You know, they're going into ufology as, you know, books, newspaper articles, DVDs, documentaries, this, that, and the other. And the MOD are just like, stop, mm -hmm. it's us. You know, this one we can tell you is definitely us. <laughs> There's even a name for them. I can't remember what they're called. Something nippy like, you know, Black Hawks or Black Triangles or something. But that's what it is, you know. And um, Boeing have, have been honest as well recently. There's been a few articles where they've come out and gone, yeah, we're developing stealth technology. Here's a photograph. Take the wheels off and it looks like a UFO. All right. You know, so if this thing flies at you, if it flies towards you, it is absolutely classic, right. classic UFO when the wheels are up underneath. Interesting. Um, and they came out with that in the 2000s, you know, in the last, I don't know, probably the last 10 or 15 years. They've released images of these stealth things. Kind of confuse people, then. And they fly really fast and they don't get picked up on radar and it's, you know, it's this, that and the other and they're whizzing them round. And, but it's some guy down on the ground with a little joystick, you know, in, in a conning tower or out on the Air Force base or whatever. And they're flying these things and they're trying them out. But that still does not answer the question of this thing that's big, you know, 20, 25 foot wide, it's taking the tops off trees and it's putting all this debris over four fields that we can't identify the debris. Still doesn't answer that in 1983. No, not at all. You know, um, but it raises enough doubt. This, this is the thing, there's sufficient doubt either way. Yes, it could be one of ours and yes, it could be one of theirs. You know, which way? It's like, the, but the timing could be good for you here, Mark. You know, in terms of what you say, because be, because people are showing a bit more interest in the potential of disclosure. This yeah. could be this could be a, a, a good time to get your book out. Hopefully, and get some reach. Well, I, I'm, I'm like I said, everybody's on the same page. So Gary's on that page. You know, Scott, the researcher, me, uh, Philip Mantle. You know, big in the UFO thing knows a hell of a lot, and we're all on the same page. And that is really. The time is here for someone to come forward and say, mm. this is what it is. You know, mm. this is what it is. Um, the only thing that maybe would cause them to hesitate is if it's one of theirs. If it's alien, then if it's an alien craft, then they have to admit to the rest. You know, who's piloting it? Where are they coming from? you know, what planet or dimension do they come from, et cetera, et cetera. That's the bit I think people would struggle with. That's the bit that's going to be hard to cope with. But less difficult now it's than it's ever been. Definitely less difficult now. And I think that's why the timing's probably better for you guys now to, to, to get stuff out there. Yeah, and it's not happened intentionally. I mean, 40 years is 40 years. It's a long we, we, time, isn't it? But we didn't plan it. You know, it crashed yeah. in 83. Yeah, it's 2023. Yeah. And it was Philip's idea. I mean, hats off to Philip at Flying Dispress. He said, why not do it as a 40th anniversary? 
Yeah. So the original idea was to put the book out in January, but for various different reasons, it's been delayed through the year. It had to come out in 2023. It's got to have that date on it, you know, publishing date. So it was going to come out this year, whatever. Yeah. But you can see why. As soon as you start reading the appendix and the analysis, you can see why it was delayed and why it went the way it went. But none of it was planned. Uh, have you had some interest in, over in the States interview? Because I know you, you, you do get interviewed. Yeah, um, in the States, don't you? America is, is um, for the people in the know, like the various ufology channels, etc., uh, most of them have jumped onto this. Mm. Um, and that's why, again, almost unintentionally, we picked up on this idea of it scratching at the door of disclosure. You know, they, they very quickly realise that this is an opportunity to say, you know, come on, the cat's out the bag. You know, mm. it's been out the bag for a while now. <laughs> Time that you, you know, told us exactly what this is and what we're dealing with. Um, I suppose if somebody just came out and went, well, it's part of a, you know, XK22, you know, Z4, whatever, Q prototype, you know, thing that's designed to, you know, go into the upper atmosphere and break the sound barrier, you know, whatever. If somebody came out and told us what it was, that's at least partial disclosure. Mm. You know, at least somebody should come out and say, well, you know, yes, you're describing the right technology and this is what it is, you know, uh, rather than the nonsense. Because what, we, what we've ended up thinking is what was going on in Australia? Why did they think it was an American glue? Because mm, yeah. Australia is a, is yeah. a whole different ball game as a country. Yeah, the way it's run and all the rest of it was there somebody in Australia from the you know, from the American side of things that went that, it? you know put a fake story in there and try and cover it up. You know, mm. I've got no doubt that it is aluminium foam, but what about the rest of it? Because it's not an American glue. Because the Americans have got no idea what this resin is. They haven't got the foggiest idea. So how come the Australians know what the American glue is? You know, it just doesn't answer that question. And then British Aerospace, they might have known what it was, and they've been told to say it's duralumin, even though it's not, because it's not duralumin. Right. But you're not telling me they didn't know it wasn't duralumin, but they said it was. Now duralumin goes all the way back to the um, airships in the First World War. And duralumin is only a trade name. It's like, you know, Coke or McDonald's or whatever. Oh, okay. It's any it's any number of 200 different alloys of aluminium. Okay. It's just a trade name. And they don't even use it anymore. Right, okay. So when you start digging a bit deeper, there is still that cover-up. You know, it's not, it's not, hey, we've got the analysis. It's full disclosure, you know. And it makes you wonder, because if, if it was... Um innocent as such then, yeah. then why would they cover it up so what, yeah. what exactly is it and yeah what's your gut feeling uh, do you know what i am so i am so on the line yeah i'm tempted to think there's no doubt that it's super technology yeah so what what we as mere mortals are handling if you like yeah. is super technology whether it came from something that the Germans developed at the end of the Second World War, okay, in which case it's us, yeah, yeah. or whether it's back-engineered alien technology from things like the crash at Roswell, mm -hmm. that's where I'm 50-50, that's where I'm on the line. Okay. And I'm not just saying that to sell books. I'm not just, you know, the book is what it is, the analysis is what it is. Mm. I am literally, totally undecided. Mm. I genuinely think it could go either way. You know, um... The function, the form, the purpose, the way it's put together, what we know of the debris itself, it could be alien. <laughs> it could be, you know, because they'd be using the same galactic elements that we'd be using, you know. Yeah. So what it's made of, in a sense, is, is not as relevant as where it came from and what it was used for. You know, that's the relevance. Um, but then equally as well, we are capable of making it. But who's going to... You know, I know, I know people are going to say, yeah, there are military, you know, trillions of dollars are going into the military machine and there's military development operations out there yeah. where they would have enough lanthium to cover four fields, you know. Yeah. But this isn't, it's not your normal standard everyday, you know, the fact that the men in black are ordering guys exactly. around at the cleanup, you yeah, know, it's, it's, and they want the metal back. It's and, very dubious. Eh? And you're talking 1983 here. Yeah. Now, well... Clearly, they're not going to want everybody to know what this stuff is, but is it because it's alien or because it's secret? It, well, this is the thing, isn't it? So what, <coughs> what, what would... Did, I'm trying to get what I'm trying to get is what would satisfy 
the investigative team that you have there? What, what do you think? If, 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 if what? If somebody was to come along and go, let's have a proper look at this, would that satisfy? And then would you be able to even trust what they tell you as well? It's so difficult. Well, because we know what we know. Yeah. So we've got aluminium foam, we've got lanthium. That's the starting point now. Yeah. Um, which was another reason for not putting the British aerospace thing in, because at the end of the day, that was superseded. That mm. was, you know, 30 years out of date. So yeah. there's no point putting that in the book at all. A complete waste of, of space. Yeah. So keeping it sharp, because that's what I do. I keep things sharp. You've got a book you can read in two or three hours. It gets you where you need to be. So we've got a starting point. So if somebody came in and said, give us a big piece of this stuff, let's have a go. I've got, well, it's there in the book. You, you've got the analysis, the breakdown. So we'd have to start from that point. Mm. And that's 21st century. So it'd be great if somebody came forward and yeah. said, yeah, we'll let you loose. We'll, we'll let you loose in the lab. You know, here's our technicians. Off you go. Let's see what you've got sort of thing. Yeah. I mean, that'd be fantastic if we got to the point where someone was willing to do that. Um, thousands of pounds or thousands of dollars, but not out of reach. Mm. It's not out of the question. You know, you could even do it on your downtime, do it overnight, do it at weekends, do whatever, you know, when, when the lab's on rest. Yeah. Um, and I think if we had confidence in the lab, I think Gary would bring the big pieces in. I'm right. quite sure. Mm. I wouldn't, I wasn't sure before the book, you know, before this little thing arrived in like Philip Mantle's post, you know, and he's like, somebody sent me pieces of a UFO in the post. You know, it's not kind of what you do, a jiffy bag with like three bits of metal in a, you know. <laughs> I thought it was so funny. It's in the book, actually. It's a photo of how it arrived. Um, and it's just not what you do with things like that. But I'm, I'm sure, I'm positive that if we, you know, if somebody really made contact mm. and said, we are behind this 100%, you know, Let's let's find out what it really is. You know, let's let's nail it completely. It'd be great, wouldn't it? Oh yeah. Um, if I had a dream, if I had a dream, <laughs> it would be to get that phone call where you know somebody phones you up and says, "Do you want to see a full one?" Oh, it'd be lovely that one. You know, it? do you want to yeah. actually see what this is from? You yeah, know, yeah. what it what it came off. Um, and it's that, yeah, you know, I don't care if it's just me cause I would tell everybody, I would, I would tell everybody. I might even be able to, you know, photograph show and tell or video footage. I, I wouldn't have any problem at all outing it and going out there and saying, you know, this is it. But if it ended up in a hangar, you know, you can imagine it. And there's this thing in the middle of the hangar and it's just, it's just floating in the yeah, middle. Yeah. Cause let's face it. We all know they're there. Yeah. It's, you know, it's ridiculous. Why, why are they covering it up? There's so many years now and there's so much evidence and there's so many witnesses and, you know, there's so many people that have come out and, I mean, even Roswell, they, they did, um, they got the CIA artificial intelligence analysis program that can tell if you're lying by analyzing your face. And they took this and they applied it to all the witnesses that they had on footage of Roswell. So they got Matt Brazel. I know he's dead, but they got Matt Brazel and they applied the AI to his interview footage. 90% of them are telling the truth mm. by American, you know, CIA lying technology, right. proper technology. They're all telling the truth. So we know these things are out there. You know, my mate that found one in a hangar down south, chances are it's probably still there. You know, and the ones in the States. So I would just love it if, you know, I mean, I've spoken to people in the military and stuff in the past. They're not bad guys in of, in, 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 in themselves. You know, yeah, yeah. I've spoken to colonels in the army and all sorts of people and, you know, whatever they can do, they will do as long as they can do it, you yeah, know. Yeah. And I'd love to get that phone call, you know, somebody from the MOD going, well, we've given it serious thought, you know, and, <laughs> you know, we think you're probably the guy to, you know, break this story and here it is, you know, and. 24 hours later, I'm stood in a hangar somewhere, you know, with this thing floating in front of me. I'm not going to freak out. I'm not going to run around screaming, going, oh, you know, aliens are being invaded. You know, I'm going to go knock on the thing and say, can I go inside it and have a look? And what is it? It'd be great, that wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? I mean, yeah. and, it, it, you know, let's turn it into an appeal because that's where we're at. It's, you know, 20, so, yeah. 2023, let's do it. You know, yeah, somebody yeah, out yeah. there. 
Somebody out in the big world, you I know. know. Yeah, yeah. Contact Flipping Mark. Heck. Yeah, let's get do it. Get in touch it. with Mark and and give him a chance to yeah, take some photographs Facebook, of the bloody thing. Messenger, you know. <laughs> contact the publisher. Anybody out there that can make it happen, yeah, you know, so we can get our hands on some of this stuff and, and actually see it. You know, I don't care if I don't work out how it works. I don't care if I don't have the plans. The mere, fact it. That, the mere fact that they exist, you know, would, would just, there you go, that would answer it. You might get a <coughs> knock by the men in black tonight, Mark. Well, they can only have my key ring and I've only got a piece the size of the little, <laughs> my little fingernail, you know what I mean? I even managed to get that in the book as well. I managed to get the key ring into Did the you? book, so... It, but that'll be the first release of any of the key rings, you know, that's gone public. Yeah. So I thought, oh, blow it, you know, now's the time. So that's, phew, that's gone. It's out there, it's in the book. But it's only a tiny piece, but it's the Lanthium. The one I've got is the Lanthium. Right. The Lantharnum, so it's it's the deer stuff. But, you know, I can see, looking ahead, I mean, you know, that's kind of where the question was going. Looking forward, I am doing a few events this next, you know, 2024, yeah. So as long as somebody doesn't come along and take me out and I don't mysteriously disappear in the meantime. I'm keeping you know, an eye on you, I've told you that. Yeah, chain me down because some of these events, you know, I'm going to I'm gonna be telling the same story. Um, mm. You know, I'm going to be, I'll be putting up the colour photos because the book has to be black and white. We couldn't do it in colour. But, you know, when I'm actually out there doing it, it'll be, it'll be full disclosure from what I've got as far as I can go, you know. Um, it's going to be an exciting year. Fantastic, Mark. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, make sure you get Mark's book. It's on, oh, a, yeah. it's on Amazon. Europe's Roswell, 40 Years Since Impact. Yeah. My oh, name. And oh. there's, there's another eight books out there to go with it. Oh, you there's can plenty go of look, books. Yeah. Oh, my missus has already yeah. started collecting. <laughs> <laughs> and then what we'll yeah. do is well, we'll add a link to the book, but we'll add a link to the documentary as well so you can go straight to it and yeah. and watch it. Still well worth watching, I hasten to add. And it's you know it, it, it does show you yeah. what there is to be seen. Yeah. And the photos are in colour. It's all in colour. Brilliant. Well, thanks again, Mark, for joining us here. Another belter. Another belter. Thanks <laughs> yeah. very much.